covering a city block a second in rush hour traffic. I get asked a lot about how I can sit down and watch a three to six hundred mile race in one sitting. And to be honest with you, it really comes down to just one thing. When I turn on that TV for a race or attend a NASCAR event, I'm not just watching a bunch of fast cars go around a racetrack. I'm anticipating a true masterpiece unfolding before my very eyes. Touch, Can't get him to the high side. The Here he comes. There, there he, he turns him. He but turns him. Bush in the oh wall. Here comes Stewart to the checkered Tony flag. Stewart. And another oh, car gets in the backside. It's Casey know. Kane. And they're scattering oh everywhere as they come to the line. At the time of making this video, NASCAR's top three divisions have raced a combined total of 4,593 races. As most people would say, that's a lot of times going around in circles. In those races, there have been around 350 different winners. A small percentage when you consider that there have been over 10,000 drivers who have cranked their engines in a NASCAR sanctioned event. Out of all those races, only a few are still talked about to this day. Just like in any other sport, there have been many games that have been played at the professional level. However, if they don't stand out in any shape or form, then inevitably, they will soon be forgotten. NASCAR is no different when it comes to races. If certain races never stand out to the fans, then they'll really never be thought of again. A race could be remembered for many reasons. Some are remembered for how many cars started the event, others for which drivers entered. Hell, some are even remembered for how bad they are. However, if a race wants to be truly remembered for many years, look no further than at the one thing that matters the most in every single race, and that is the finish. To find out what makes the best finish in NASCAR history, we are going to look at multiple categories to see what makes these finishes so popular. We will start off with the least recognizable, then make our way up to the absolute best. Let's start with the category that is an impressive way to win, however, it lacks the excitement that most fans crave, the domination win. The domination win is a type of win that you see throughout most racing series. The same goes with NASCAR. In the 1965 Southern 500, Ned Jarrett not only dominated the race, but was in a league of his own. By the time the checkered flag flew, Ned Jarrett was able to beat the second place car by over 14 laps, the equivalent of almost 20 miles. To this day, that record stands as the largest margin of victory in NASCAR history, a feat that is super impressive when you take into the fact that Ned Jarrett only took the lead with 39 laps to go. Although Cale Yarbrough was not able to put a 14 lap difference against his fellow competitors, he was able to do something that was equally impressive, and that was lead every lap in a race. In 1973, Cale Yarbrough was able to do the unthinkable and lead all 500 laps in the Southeastern 500 at Bristol International Speedway, beating the likes of Richard Petty, Bobby Allison, and Benny Parsons in the process. What's even more impressive is that he was able to do the same thing only five years later at the Fairground Speedway in Nashville, a feat that no one thought would be duplicated in the modern NASCAR Cup Series. That is, until Jeff Burton was able to accomplish this at New Hampshire Motor Speedway in 2000. During this year, NASCAR decided to add restrictor plates for the one-mile racetrack, as two drivers would lose their lives from accidents in practice sessions. Even though this slew down the cars considerably, making it safer for the drivers, it would inevitably cause passing to be almost impossible. Luckily for Burton, he would start in the front row in the race, and thanks to a good jump at the beginning, he was able to be one of two drivers to lead every single lap in the modern NASCAR Cup Series. Being able to lead every lap on a short track is impressive. Hell, leading every lap at a one mile track with restrictor plates is incredible in itself, but leading every lap in a super speedway race with restrictor plates? Now that is pure domination, and something that one of the best restrictor plate drivers were able to do in the 2003 Busch Series season, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Dale Jr. was one of the top drivers in the early 2000s, but when it came to the super speedway races, no one else could compete. In the 2003 season, Dale Jr. would enter into three races in the Bush Series, both the Daytona races and the Talladega race. 
Not only was he able to win all the races that he attended, but he was able to lead all 100 laps in the Wawa 250. An impressive feat when you realize that the average amount of passes for the lead in a restrictor plate race was 27. But even then, that may not be one of the most dominant performances that we have seen in a NASCAR event. If we truly want to see one of the most impressive performances in NASCAR history, we have to look at a race that happened only just a few years back, the 2016 Coca-Cola 600. In this race, Martin Trex Jr., a driver who had three victories up to this point, was able to lead a staggering 392 laps out of 400 in the event. This would mean that the future champion would lead 588 miles in a 600 mile event. Not bad for a driver who everyone wrote off as a bust in the early 2010s. Being a dominant driver is an impressive feat on its own, however it is not the most exciting spectacle to watch from a fan's perspective. If we want to see more exciting finishes, we are going to have to see races where drivers put their cars to the absolute limit. Ross Chastain was able to cement himself as one of the most popular drivers when he did the unthinkable in the penultimate race of the 2022 season. In the final corners of the race, Chastain would shift up going into the corner and ride the wall all the way up to the fourth position, leading to him competing for the championship. Even though this move was impressive in itself, it wasn't even for the victory. There have been countless times where drivers have done everything they can to collect the checkered flag. In 2016 during a truck series event, John Hunter Nemechek would be chasing down Cole Custer in the final corners at Canadian Tire Motorsports Park. In these types of situations, most drivers would try to do the bump and run, or even the crossover. However, on this day, John Hunter Nemechek had different plans. Custer hanging on! Nemechek gets into him! John Hunter Nemechek and Cole Custer, they're wrecking and spinning, coming to the line! Who is it going to be? I think it looked like Nema it looked like Nemechek to me, but I'm not sure. And we have been told that John Hunter Nemechek has been declared the winner. Nemechek would be able to win the race by the slimmest of margins. However, it was not well received by most drivers, as they felt that the move was more dirty rather than impressive. One driver that would be outspoken about this would be Kyle Larson, a driver who would attempt a fate similar to Ross Chastain in the 2021 Southern 500. Denny Hamlin would be leading the event while Kyle Larson was in second. In the final corner, he would push the car throughout the turn but would not be able to complete the pass for the victory. A similar fate would happen to one of the most unluckiest drivers in NASCAR, Carl Edwards. Edwards would be known as one of the better drivers to not be able to win the championship. That didn't make it any less entertaining to watch him as he would perform some crazy performances throughout his career. In fact, Edwards would be one of the first drivers to perform the infamous video game move all the way back in 2008 at Kansas Speedway. He would try the bonsai pass on Jimmy Johnson in turns 3 and 4. The move would not work for Carl Edwards and he would wind up finishing second anyways, this time with a damaged car. A move that was deemed humorous by many and thought that it would be the only time any NASCAR driver would attempt a move to that nature. Video game moves are fun to watch, but most of the time they end in disappointment. But that's not to say there have been drivers who have pushed their cars to the absolute limit and were able to get the victory. If there was a driver who was the definition of make it or break it, it was Davey Allison a driver that fans were never able to see his full potential. During the 1992 season, Davey Allison was collecting a lot of victories throughout the season. However, his amount of DNFs were stacking up as well. It seemed like every single race Allison was a part of, he had the same chance to win the race as he was to reckon it. But somehow, he was able to learn how to wreck and win at the same time. During the 1992 All-Star Race, one of the most exciting finishes in All-Star history would come down between three drivers, Dale Earnhardt, Kyle Petty, and Davey Allison. Going down the back straightaway, Kyle Petty and Dale Earnhardt would be racing hard for the victory, causing Earnhardt to get spun in turn number three. It turned out that would only be the first incident that would come on the last lap. Coming to the checkered flag. Here comes Davey Allison to the bottom. It'll be the finish. Everybody oh, was oh, waiting for it. Oh, they crashed past the finish line. Uh -oh. They have crashed into turn number one. 
and Davey Allison is in a shower of sparks. He won the race, but he sure paid the price for it. Davey Allison would win the race, but would have to celebrate the victory in the hospital due to the fact that he suffered a concussion, bruised lung, and battered body in the incident. He would not be able to celebrate in victory lane with his destroyed car. That would not be the same for one of the most likable drivers in NASCAR throughout the 80s and 90s, Terry Labonte, a soft-spoken driver that would win his two championships 12 years apart from each other, the longest time in between two championships for a driver. During the last few laps of the 1995 Goodies 500, it looked like Terry Labonte would easily collect another short track victory in the 95 season. That was until he ran into lap traffic, causing the seven-time champion to come up to his back bumper in the final lap. It's worth noting that at this moment, Dale Earnhardt was behind the current points leader by almost two races. If he was able to make a comeback, he needed to start winning. He sees his moment in the final corner and goes for it. Terry Labonte's car was able to get across the start-finish line and win the Instant Classic at Bristol, despite the fact that his car was destroyed on the final lap. Something that didn't really bother Terry Labonte or his team as they took photos with the Mangle machine in victory lane, proving that if you push the car to the limit and receive the victory, all can be forgiven. But what happens when a driver pushes the car to the absolute extreme and not only fails to get the victory, but also takes out his fellow competitor? Oh no, there they go! Wow, it didn't work out for either one of them. There's an old saying in sports, it ain't over till it's over. Throughout NASCAR's history, there have been countless times where drivers sitting in the second position were able to collect the victory thanks to the misfortune of the leader. One of the most common ways a driver could lose a race in the 2000s and 2010s was the simple fuel strategy, a slightly controversial way for a driver to win the race by saving fuel in the final stretch to avoid making an additional pit stop. Many drivers have tried this with a mix of success and failure. Mark Martin was able to collect one of his last victories with this strategy thanks to both Jimmy Johnson and Greg Biffle running out of fuel in the final laps at Michigan. Almost six years later, a similar event would happen at Pocono when most of the field would run out of fuel on the final lap, causing Matt Kansas to collect his second victory of the season. As unpredictable as these fuel strategy finishes may seem, they are not known as the most thrilling. There seems to always be a slight sour taste in the fan's mouth when they know that the finish was merely based on math and drivers going slower on the racetrack. It's completely different when it comes to drivers pushing it to the limit. In 2018, at the inaugural Charlotte Roval, Ryan Blaney would pull off a shocking win when the seven-time champion would overdrive the last corner, causing him to spin both himself and Martin Trex Jr. It was a finish that no one saw coming, cementing the Charlotte Roval as a cutoff race in the playoffs. Road courses can cause some uncertainty, while Super Speedway can cause nothing but. Due to the tight racing that you get at Daytona and Talladega, a big accident can come from seemingly any part of the race, and in the 2012 Daytona x Fandy race, it happened to be on the last lap. Going into the final corners, 10 drivers had an opportunity to win one of the biggest races in the x Fandy season. However, thanks to some drivers pushing it too far, it caused a big accident collecting almost every single driver in the pack. Well, except one, James Busher. Thanks to Busher losing connection with his drafting partner, he would fall deep enough behind to avoid the carnage, giving him the upset victory. If winning a race by having the leaders take each other out is shocking, then having it happen twice for you is almost unbelievable. But that's exactly what would happen with Kyle Busch, the driver with the most victories in NASCAR's top three divisions combined. Kyle Busch would have the opportunity of a lifetime when he was able to get past a rivaling Joey Logano and Denny Hamlin, who would make contact in turns 3 and 4, eliminating both their chances of winning and giving Kyle Busch his first win of the 2013 season. The same thing would happen almost 9 years later, when Chase Briscoe would take out Tyler Reddick on the final corner of the Bristol Dirt Race, leading to Kyle Busch sneaking by Tyler Reddick by just a few car lengths. Kyle Busch would be ecstatic about the win and would say that he felt like Dale Earnhardt, 
which was an odd statement to say as the Intimidator had been on the wrong end of incidents similar to this. In the 1980s, Dale Earnhardt and Dale Waltrip were known as the best of the best. They would beat bitter rivals throughout the 80s and would get under each other's skin from time to time. However, in the 1986 Miller 400, both drivers would reach their boiling point as the final laps would end in pain for both drivers as they would wreck each other near the end of the race. This would not only take out Daryl Waltrip and Dale Earnhardt, but it would also take out the third car as well, giving Kyle Petty the chance to sneak around en route to his first victory in the Cup Series. Many consider this to be the starting point of Earnhardt becoming the Intimidator in NASCAR making him one of the biggest villains of the 1980s. With great finishes comes great stories, and in the world of stories, nothing is more important than the two biggest characters, the hero, and of course, the villain. For a lot of race fans, they will always cheer when their favorite driver is winning, but they tend to cheer a little harder when their most hated driver wrecks out. In today's NASCAR, the cheers of Kyle Busch wrecking is almost the same as when Chase Elliott takes the lead. It's funny to watch NASCAR fans go nuts when their least favorite driver wrecks. It's even funnier when you see them watch their least favorite driver take the victory. In 2019, Kyle Busch won what many believed was one of the best finishes with the Gen 6 car, as he was able to wheel his car around the racetrack against a late charging Kyle Larson. The two would make contact at two separate parts of the racetrack. However, it would be Kyle Busch that would be able to win the race, to the dissatisfaction of the fans. Of course, Kyle Busch did his signature crying face when he grabbed the checkered flag, a slightly different approach to Dale Earnhardt when he would spin out Terry Labonte in the 1999 race at Bristol Motor Speedway. In a race that looked to be similar to four years prior, Labonte was in front while Earnhardt was in second. Only this time, Earnhardt did not take the chance and decided to get into the back of Terry Labonte in turn number two, a move that even the diehard fans thought was a little too much. Of course, one of the newer villains of the sport is arguably Joey Logano, a driver who has gotten under the skin of many of his competitors throughout the years, but none more so than the drivers at Joe Gibbs Racing. In the 2018 race at Martinsville, Martin Trex Jr. was looking to grab his first ever victory at a short track. All he had to do was hold off Joey Logano in the final corners and he would be able to win his first. However, it seemed like Logano took major inspiration from the Intimidator as he would power his way through the 78 car, leading to his second win of the season. A drag race, they're sideways, and it's going to be Logano getting the win. Logano would end up winning his first ever championship in the Cup Series, a feat that he mostly thanks to his last lap move at Martinsville. Being a dirty driver to get your first championship can be understandable. However, some would probably reconsider getting their first victory if it meant being public enemy number one, but Brian Vickers would say otherwise. In the 2006 UAW 500, Dale Jr. and Jimmy Johnson were battling on the last lap in what looked to be a big points day towards the championship for the two drivers. The third driver in the battle was Brian Vickers, a driver who is in his last year with Henrik Motorsports and is uncertain where he will be going next season. The relationship is starting to get a little sour with the team as Vickers is no longer being invited to race meetings at this point making him a true outcast at one of the best teams in motorsports. He has been close to winning a few races at the Super Speedway events, but ends up coming up short thanks to his teammates having more importance. On the last lap on the back straightaway, Vickers stays to the back bumper of Jimmy Johnson in an attempt to get around Dale Jr. However, Johnson makes an aggressive dive to the bottom that neither driver is prepared for. Brian Vickers sees this as his one last opportunity to get a victory in the number 25 car and takes it. Getting a little wider. There he goes. Junior. Oh, no! There's it's the 49. Up to 48. It takes out Earnhardt and Jimmy Johnson. Caution is out. The leaders had already taken the white flag. The win would be one of the most infamous moments at Talladega as no one agreed to the move on Vickers' part. However, one thing that couldn't be taken away from him was his win. Vickers would eventually leave Henrik Motorsports and would become a Toyota racer all the way to his final days in the Cup Series. Villains in the sport can get annoying after a while, meaning that many yearn for a good guy to come up and win. With that being said, it feels even better when you have a David who is able to beat a Goliath. David has truly beat the Goliath of NASCAR Busch Series races. David Gallus wins at Kentucky. When an underdog gets a victory, it can make a regular race feel like an instant classic. 
If it has a good finish on top of it, then many fans will never forget. Take the 2019 race at Kentucky. This was around the time where Kurt Busch was no longer looked at as a dastardly villain in his heyday, but rather a driver that did everything he could to score at least one win a season. His brother Kyle Busch, on the other hand, is still winning races left and right, and still seen to many as the guy you love to boo in the sport. In the final restart of the race, Kurt Busch would have the restart of a lifetime and would get around both Joey Logano and Kyle Busch in the back straightaway, leading to one of the best finishes at the infamous track at Kentucky Speedway. Kurt Busch with the advantage! Kyle Busch slides! Kurt Busch will win! What a finish! <laughs> Kurt Busch would get the slight advantage in the trioval and score a big victory for Chip Ganassi Racing. This was great to see as the amount of underdog winners was starting to dwindle in the late 2010s. The same could not be said for races that were happening just less than a decade earlier when some of the biggest underdog wins would happen in the Cup Series. In 2011, Trevor Bain would pull off the craziest upset in Daytona 500 history by winning the Great American Race in only his second start. What would be as impressive would be the victory that happened almost two years before, when Brad Keselowski pulled off the win at Talladega. He would start the race with a small team known as James Finch Racing, a star and park team that would only run the full races in the Super Speedway events. They were such long shots that odds makers didn't even list them. At this point, Brad Keselowski was only known as a driver in the lower series. However, he would become a household name after this exciting finish. car. No! Edwards will not make it to the flag. Oh, Brad Keselowski won this race. Unbelievable. The finish would go down as one of the best finishes in Talladega history and would be known as one of the biggest upsets in the turn of the century. Of course, if I'm going to talk about underdogs in the number 09 machine, I should bring up one of the most liked underdogs at road courses, Boris said. Boris said has been racing in road course events in NASCAR since the mid-1990s, but only has one victory in the truck series in his first 15 years of racing. That would change in 2010, when he was able to edge out the other road course winners by the slightest of margins. Nationwide series, finally. Boris Said's win was outstanding to say the least, but if you want my honest opinion, the best road course ringer victory would happen two years later at Watkins Glen. Ambrose was already known for his talent at road courses, especially at Watkins Glen International Raceway. He was able to win the race in 2011 after a late race caution would secure him his first victory in the Cup Series. The very next year he was looking to do the same thing again, only this time he would have two future champions in front of him, Brad Keselowski and Kyle Busch. With just one lap to go and a course covered in oil, he was going to have to do everything he could to get around two of the very best. While he tries to get the lead from Kyle, oh, contact fantastic. in the S's. And Clyde got all the way around. Yeah, And will the nine help him? Oh, Everybody's in the grass. Because <laughs> Lousy's well, got a problem. Trying to stay with Ambrose. Two final corners. Do they use the bumpers? A nudge, a push. Can Ambrose save it? To the checkered flag. Who gets here first? Clear, clear. Ambrose, back to nine. Kozlowski, two. Final corner. Marcus Ambrose is going to win at Watkins Glen in a remarkable last lap turn of events. Marcus Ambrose would get the win as well as let everyone know in the NASCAR world who the new king was at Watkins Glen. Although he would never win at the track again, there was never a race where he wasn't a contender. Underdog wins are usually favored by the fans and make for a great feel-good story. But what if there were some finishes out there that only relied on the story to make a memorable finish to a race. NASCAR is no stranger to the occasional feel-good story. 
Whether the win was dedicated to someone or lifted the spirits of a nation, NASCAR has experienced races where you can't help but just be happy for the parties involved. Take the 2004 Bass Pro Shops 500, a race that was ran with heavy hearts after a plane crash would take the lives of 10 people, most belonging to the Rick Henrik family. Jimmy Johnson would be able to collect a victory making it his third straight win up to that point. Johnson would not do burnouts on the racetrack, but instead would take the car into victory lane, hop out of the car, and embrace his teammates. Truly a feel-good story that many from the organization needed in order to push forward. It's amazing to see drivers race for a victory that was meant for someone else, but it's always great to also hear a true comeback story of the ages. Take the 1997 Miller 400 at Michigan Air National Speedway, for example, a race that saw Ernie Irvin take the victory in style with his wife on top of the pit box. The reason why this race meant so much to both Ernie and his wife was because Ernie almost lost his life at the same racetrack three years prior. In a practice session, Ernie Irvin would suffer a blown tire, causing him to hit the outside wall at more than 170 miles per hour. The wreck caused him to suffer a basilar skull fracture, giving him only a 10% chance of surviving. He would not only be able to survive the horrific incident, but would also return to racing almost 13 months later. The injury did take a toll on the 1991 Daytona 500 winner, as his finishes were not as consistent as before. However, he would prove to everyone that Michigan International Speedway would not get the best of him, as it would be his best statistical racetrack after his return. Wondering if you will ever win again is always a concern. However, it's a whole different level when the questions start to loom if you will ever get your first victory. In 2021, Michael McDowell would do the unthinkable and win his first ever race at the Daytona 500 in his 358th start. On the final lap, Team Penske would make a big mistake and have both their cars get totaled on the last turn of the race, giving the win to a driver who mostly ran mediocre equipment throughout his Cup Series career. Of course, it would be unfair to be talking about a Michael getting their first win at the Great American Race if I didn't mention the driver who took the longest to get his first win, Michael Waltrip. Michael Waltrip was finally able to win in the Cup Series in his 463rd start. Sadly, his win would be foreshadowed due to another last lap crash that took away one of the greatest drivers in NASCAR, a tragic incident that has still left heavy hearts with fans to this very day. The 2001 season did its best to help heal the wounds by having some of the best feel-good races in NASCAR history. Three races tend to pop up in my mind when I think of the best races of 2001. But for now, let's focus on the ones that came from a special organization for the Intimidator, Dale Earnhardt Incorporated. The first race after the passing of Dale Earnhardt would be at North Carolina Speedway, a one-mile racetrack that would be taken off the schedule after the end of the 2004 season. Up to this point, no driver from the organization was able to win at the racetrack. However, with everything that transpired in the last seven days, many knew that the team had a little extra push that weekend compared to the rest of the field. The one to win the race was Steve Parks, a driver who suffered a lot of bad luck in his career due to horrific incidents. However, it would be him that would hoist the trophy after the most tragic crash in NASCAR history. Dale Earnhardt Jr., Earnhardt's son, would have even a better feel-good story as he would return to Daytona International Speedway that year in the Pepsi 400 and do something only fairy tales would be able to duplicate. But it's going to be Dale Earnhardt Jr. using lessons learned from his father at Daytona, Dell Jr. on top of the car in the infield. The 1998 Daytona 500, when his father finally won the Great American Race, he threw the car into the grass doing victory donuts. Everybody joining in the celebration. Dale Jr. would be able to win at the racetrack that took away his father's life only five months prior, leading to all of DEI being able to celebrate in the infield together and having Michael Waltrip and Dale Jr. embrace each other on top of the cars. Truly an image that will stand the test of time in the NASCAR racing world. Now we come to the point in the video where fans start to truly debate which finishes are the best of all time. The finishes that celebrated the best of the year turn into the best of the decade. 
To find out which finishes should sit near the top, we need to run it by some legends in the sport. It's no surprise that each legend in the sport has seen at least one amazing finish in their career and wind up on top. It's one of the many reasons why we separate them from all the rest. Countless times we can look at one race that cemented themselves as true legends. The king himself Richard was no stranger to victory lane. To this day, no one comes even close to the amount of victories that he was able to get in NASCAR's top series. Still, even throughout those 200 victories, it would be his last one that would be one of the most memorable. The 1984 Firecracker 400 at Daytona International Speedway was quite a spectacle to say the least. It would be President Ronald Reagan who would lead the starting command in the race, as well as have his plane televised landing while cars were blistering down the back straightaway. Up front, it would be a fierce battle between Richard Petty and Kel Yarbrough, a driver we have mentioned earlier about his dominance. The two would be in a fierce battle throughout the entire day, and it would come down to a final dash to the start-finish line. Richard Petty would have a nose on the 28 car and would take the checkered flag to secure his 200th victory in NASCAR. Truly a remarkable way to end his career. Unfortunately for him, he would continue into the 90s and go down a rough path of poor finishes and not qualify for events. The same couldn't be said for the Wonder Boy himself, Jeff Gordon, a driver who remained a fierce competitor all the way to his last season in NASCAR. The 33rd race of the 2015 season would truly be a remarkable showing as eight drivers were looking to secure a spot in the championship four, while others had goals of their own. The final 70 laps could only be described as pure chaos as one crash would take out some of the most competitive drivers in the race, while another crash would be one of the worst moments of revenge in NASCAR history. In the end, it would be between Jeff Gordon and Jamie McMurray, leading to an almost perfect storybook ending for the four-time champion. To the 2015 season, out of three and four, this win's gonna punch his ticket to the championship four. Jeff Gordon's retirement season was so impressive that Tony Stewart would try to perfect the same thing just a year later. The three-time champ is in a different situation as Jeff Gordon, as the last few years have been abysmal for Stewart. He is hoping that this last season can end up on a good note to an otherwise impressive career. That opportunity would come at the 2016 Save Mart 350 at Sonoma, where Tony Stewart was the strongest he has been in a very long time. There was just one issue. The only cars that can keep up with the three-time champ is Denny Hamlin and Carl Edwards, two drivers from the same organization that Stewart had his first opportunity in the Cup Series. Denny Hamlin is in a different situation, as he is one of the top drivers in the sport at this time, collecting victories at all types of racetracks. On the last lap, he is able to get around Stewart on turn 7, a move that broke a lot of hearts at that point as many believed that the race would be over. However, going down the S's as well as the final corner before turn 11, Tony Stewart is able to come back into striking distance of the number 11 car. It's at this point that I would like to point out that Stewart is not like other drivers. He is willing to knock drivers out of the way in order to get the victory. If this was Gordon, then perhaps we would see this finish play differently. Nonetheless, Stewart knows that this is his last chance and goes for broke in the last corner. Here we go. Uh, uh, uh. Stewart inside. Oh, he he is there. Won. He Wait, gets won. Hamlin. They won. hit him. And Stewart comes up. Turn 11. Look at that. He's coming to the play. Me? <laughs> With a spectacular finish. Wow. He just made the chase. Two right drivers who both refused to lose on the last lap. Stewart would get the win at Sonoma Raceway. However, as November came around, he was already eliminated from the championship. That year's Final Four would be drivers who looked competitive all throughout the season, one of them being Jimmy Johnson. Johnson is known to many as the greatest driver to race in the NASCAR playoff era as he was able to win the championship in three different playoff format styles as well as five championships in a row. By the time 2016 came around, he's no longer the strongest driver but still a tough competitor when it mattered most. In the final race of the season, the race would come down to a restart with Carl Edwards and Joey Logano on the inside row. 
Logano is still upset of what happened last year and is refusing to give an inch to his fellow competitor on the restart, which caused the biggest wreck in the championship race, causing the gates to open for the driver in the number 48 machine, prompting him to get around some of the fastest cars in the race and put himself in the elite seven-time champion level as the other greats. Three and four, make room, Richard Petty and Dale Earnhardt. There's another seven-time champ. Jimmy Johnson wins his seventh NASCAR Sprint Cup Championship. All these legends were able to go out on top near the end of their careers. However, if you ask me, there is one other legend that has the best legacy win in NASCAR. When most people ask who the best driver is in NASCAR history, most will usually say Dale Earnhardt. There are countless moments where people can put Earnhardt as his legend-defining moment. However, none come even close to when he was able to take down his biggest obstacle of all, the Daytona 500. In over 19 attempts in the Great American Race, Dale Earnhardt was not able to win the biggest event of the year. It wasn't that he was bad at the racetrack either. In fact, he was considered to many as the greatest super speedway racer of all time. It just seemed like no matter how good Dale Earnhardt was in a race, some outside interference would take away his chance from winning the Daytona 500. In 1998, attempt number 20 would come for the seven-time champ to see if he would be able to win the race. He had one of the strongest cars again, but many people felt like they had seen this story many times before. As the last caution flew in the race, many were wondering what was going to happen to the number 3 car that would take away his chance of winning the biggest crown jewel in NASCAR. Except this time, it never happened. 20 years of trying, 20 years of frustration. Dale Earnhardt will come to the caution flag to win the Daytona 500. Finally, the most anticipated moment in racing. If John Elway can win the Super Bowl, Dale Earnhardt said he could win the Daytona 500. And if he comes around under caution to complete this final lap, look out on pit road. Every man on every crew has come out to the edge of pit lane to congratulate the man who has dominated everything there is to win in this sport, except this race until today. Dale Earnhardt would finally win the race that had plagued him for so many years, an accomplishment that was so well deserved that every member from every crew would come congratulate him, a finish that would make almost every NASCAR diehard fan happy. However, if you were to show this to people outside the fan base, they would probably just shrug it off. If we want to find a finish that is going to be loved by all, we are going to have to have things come down to the wire. Here comes Alvarola, crash into the wall. I think it's Stenhouse, it might be Blaney. Oh my goodness, they were what, three, four wide? To find out the greatest finish in NASCAR, we are going to have to look at the most thrilling finishes of them all, the photo finish. A finish that is so close that you have to rely on replays or images in order to confirm the winner. One of the first ever photo finishes in NASCAR would come from the first ever Daytona 500, where three cars would be side by side at the finish line. The finish was so close that officials couldn't make the final decision on who won the race. The decision would have to come three days later when a photo would pop up that confirmed that Lee Petty had the advantage over Johnny Beauchamp at the start-finish line, giving Richard Petty's father the first ever Daytona 500 win. Almost 50 years later, the Daytona 500 would see another photo finish with a little bit more chaos mixed in the end. Coming to the final corner of the Daytona 500, many drivers would wreck going towards the start finish line. At first, it looked like Mark Martin was going to be able to win the Great American Race in his 23rd attempt. However, it would be the driver of the 29 car that would be able to beat Mark Martin by a mere two one hundredths of a second, making it the closest finish in Daytona 500 history only to be beaten 10 years later when Denny Hamlin would be able to win the Great American Race by 1 100th of a second in 2016. 
Kevin Harvick being a victor in a photo finish shouldn't have been a surprise to many, as he was able to do the same thing in only his third start. Remember back when I said there were three feel-good finishes that happened in the 2001 season? Well, I forgot to mention the one that is remembered the most, the 2001 Atlanta race. In only the third race after the passing of Dale Earnhardt, the driver that would take over his ride was in a spot to win at the same track Dale won a year prior. There was just one problem. The guy chasing him down was Dale Earnhardt's strongest rival in the 1990s, Jeff Gordon. Jeff Gordon is clearly the stronger car, however Kevin Harvick has the preferred line, whoever would get the best exit off of turn 4 would get the victory. Slow car, slow car is going to be in the way. Just That's like a year ago, he's going to get him though, he's going to get him. Gordon got loose, it's Harvick. Harvick by inches. Harvick by inches. Harvick by inches. What a race. What a finish. Harvick, you got it. That's six, one thousand. Of a in a finish almost similar to Dale Earnhardt's a year prior, Kevin Harvick would get his first career win as a Cup Series driver, a win that is loved by both the fans as well as admired from those outside the sport. The finish was a mere six one thousandths of a second apart between the two competitors, making it one of the closest finishes in NASCAR. Winning by six one thousandths of a second is incredible, but winning by two one thousandths of a second is unimaginable. But that would happen in the 2011 Aaron's 499 race at Talladega. The closest finish in NASCAR history would happen where eight cars would finish within two tenths of each other. This would tie as the closest finish in the NASCAR Cup Series, but not the closest finish in NASCAR's top three divisions as both the Truck Series and Xfinity Series have seen even closer finishes in their lifetime. In the inaugural season of the Truck Series, Mike Skinner and Butch Miller had the closest finish in Truck Series history at Colorado National Speedway, where Butch Miller would beat Mike Skinner by a mere 1 1,000th of a second, thus making it one of the closest finishes ever. It would remain the closest finish in NASCAR as a whole until the 2018 Daytona Xfinity Series race, a crazy race that would see five overtimes before the checker flag would fly in the event. On the last lap, it would be between the Xfinity Series veteran Elliott Sadler versus the newcomer of the series, Tyler Reddick. Off of turn four, many knew that it was going to be a photo finish. However, no one knew that the finish would be as close as it was. But to the inside, it's Elliott Sadler, a photo finish. Tyler Reddick's going to edge him out, and Tyler Reddick, at the line, pulls it off. When the time interval was revealed, it was an unbelievable four ten thousandths of a second interval between the first and second place car, making it the closest finish in NASCAR history. By all metrics, this race should be known as the greatest finish in NASCAR as a whole. It had the chaoticness that fans crave, the newcomer winning the big race, and the closest down to the wire finish. However, many fans don't even know about this finish due to the fact that it was in the minor series, as well as only touching on a few categories rather than all of them. If we truly want to find the greatest finish ever, we're going to have to go to truly the best of the best, ones that will never ever be duplicated again. When it comes to the greatest finishes ever, these are truly the best of the best. Finishes that no matter how many times you try, they can never be duplicated. Most of them almost cover every category that we have mentioned throughout this entire video, and now we get to see which ones are truly a once in a lifetime finish. We have talked about cars getting absolutely destroyed in the hopes of collecting a victory. However, we have not talked about one race where the cars were absolutely destroyed before the race was even over. This would happen at the biggest race of the year in the 1976 Daytona 500. We have talked a lot about legends in this video, but one that has been left out in almost all of them has been David Pearson. Pearson was known to many as the Silver Fox, and there's a good reason for that. He wasn't really known for running full seasons in the sport, but rather attending certain races in the year. Because of this, many competitors would state when you saw him at the racetrack, you expected him to win. His biggest rival throughout his career would be the King himself, as they would finish 1-2 in 63 different races. If there was ever a 1-2 finish that was head and shoulders above the rest, it was this race. 
Like many races before, it would come down to the final lap between the 43 car and the 21 car. The only difference was that this was the biggest race of the year and neither driver was refusing to give an inch. The two would rocket down the final two corners hoping that they would be the first ones to the line. The only issue was they had to get there first. <laughs> He's gonna win the race. He's gonna win it spinning. As he, I believe, will take the checkered flag. No, he did not make it. As fate would have it, both the leaders would wreck on the trioval coming to the checkered flag, but thanks to them being so dominant throughout the race, the winner would be determined on whoever made it to the start finish line first. David Pearson would be first while Richard Petty would be stuck in the mud watching his rival take the checkered flag as his team desperately tried to push the car across, making it the one and only Daytona 500 win for David Pearson. Three years would go by before we would see Richard Petty as a factor in the Daytona 500 race and what has to be the race that put NASCAR on the map. On February 18, 1979, a giant snowstorm swept throughout the eastern part of the United States, causing millions of people to stay home rather than fight the egregious weather. That same day, the Daytona 500 would host the race flag to flag, making it the first 500 mile race to be broadcast in its entirety live on national TV in the United States. Roughly 15 million people decided to watch the southern event in hopes to catch something exciting to happen on TV. In the final laps of the race, it would come down to two drivers, Cal Yarbrough, a driver at the end of a spectacular championship run, and Donnie Allison, brother to the great Bobby Allison, who won the 500 a year prior. Richard Petty is sitting in third, holding off Dale Waltrip in the hopes that he can close out the race with the top three. Little did all of us know that his battle for the third position would soon become the battle for the victory in just half a lap. Between Cale Yarbrough and Donnie Allison, the tempers overflowing. They're angry. They know they have lost. And what a bitter defeat. The race seen by millions would become one of the best finishes in stock car history. The final lap would provide a last lap incident with the leaders, the king of NASCAR getting the opportunity of a lifetime, and a fight between two drivers who were so close to victory only to have it end in turn number three. The beginning of the season has the opportunity to provide a spectacular finish as not much is on the line at that point. It's a whole different story when you get a spectacular finish at a championship race when everything is on the line. No matter how big the Daytona 500 may be to NASCAR, it still doesn't hold up to the same level as winning a championship. In 1992, perhaps the most exciting championship race unfolded at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Statistically, there were six drivers that had an opportunity to win the championship. However, realistically, it was down to three drivers, Davey Allison, Bill Elliott, and Alan Kowicki. Davey Allison and Bill Elliott have had both a chaotic but successful season, while Alan Kowicki, a driver owner in the sport, has been minding his P's and Q's and collecting top 10 finishes wherever he can get them. In the final race of the season, so much unpredictability happened in the race. Dale Earnhardt would cause a crash on lap number two, causing damage to one of the championship contenders. A big wreck would happen on lap number 96, collecting the king in what would be his last race in the Cup Series. Heartbreak would happen for Davey Allison on lap 254 as his chaotic season would end on the wrong side of the last race ending his championship run. And finally, at the last green flag run of the race, a fierce battle between two drivers would last an unthinkable 70 laps, which ended with Alan Kowicki beating Bill Elliott by only 10 points. A number that is crazy to think about when you consider that the driver who led the most laps in a race would receive five bonus points. Bill Elliott would lead 102 laps, while Alan Kowicki would lead 103. 
meaning one lap was the difference between who would win the championship as Bill Elliott would have won the tiebreaker. Allen would win and prove to everyone that even the underdog still had a chance to win championships in the fast growing sport. Almost 30 years later, another team owner would win a championship, but in closer circumstances. In 2011, NASCAR would alter the points system in hopes to revamp the already controversial chase for the championship. That year, Tony Stewart was in his third year with his own team, Stewart Haas Racing. For the first 26 races, the season has been lackluster at best as Stewart barely sneaks his way into the chase, basically stating that he would be a waste of a spot in the championship. However, during those nine races in the chase, Stewart was able to win four of them, completely turning the season around in what looked to be a mediocre one at best. The only driver ahead of him entering the final race is the driver we have mentioned multiple times before in this video, Carl Edwards. He is having one of the most consistent seasons of his career. The only thing that is lacking on his season is his one lone victory at Las Vegas. All Edwards needs to do is finish in front of Tony Stewart or have Stewart not win the race and he will be a Cup Series champion. On the last restart, Tony Stewart would have the drive of his career as he would get past NASCAR's very best and hold off Carl Edwards in the final 30 laps of the race. Tony Stewart would get the win in the race and win the tiebreaker in the championship thanks to his late season resurgence in the chase, ending what many thought would be one of the greatest finishes in the NASCAR championship. But as great as all these finishes have been, they still don't come to the same level as what I feel is the greatest finish in NASCAR history. It's the one most of us already know, but still holds up to all that see it. If you want to see the best NASCAR finish of all time, then look no further than the 2003 race at Darlington Raceway. You know, we have covered quite a few categories in this video, but we have never seen one finish that has been able to fit into every single category. In the last laps of the Carolina Dodge Dealer 400, it would be down to just two drivers, Kurt Busch and Ricky Craven. Kurt Busch was one of the most unlikable drivers in the sport, causing controversy wherever he went. Although he wasn't at his worst at this point, the fans were already turning against him in the 2003 season. The other driver is Ricky Craven, a driver who has been able to score one victory in his career, but other than that, he has been a mid-tier driver at best. If he is able to win this race, then it will be a true underdog victory. Near the end of the race, it looked like the ones that were going to be running for the victory would be Jeff Gordon and Elliott Sadler. However, thanks to some mistakes by the two, the gates would open for these two to have a shot at the victory. The racetrack is providing some great racing as it is one of the oldest tracks on the schedule. However, it looks to be on the verge as one of the next racetracks to lose its spot on the NASCAR schedule, which worries the fans. If NASCAR is able to see a good finish today, then perhaps the legacy of this track will continue on. With just three laps to go, Ricky Craven has been able to catch up the Kurt Busch, who is suffering from power steering issues. If Craven is able to get around the future champion, he is going to have to do something that can never be duplicated again, leading to the greatest 60 seconds of NASCAR racing. Who's going to get off? Here he oh. comes. Here he comes. He's got him this time. It's going to be a drag race. Wow. Oh. They touch. They touch. Craven, oh. Craven got Craven. him. Craven got Craven him. Craven got him. And Craven. All right. What a finish. Have you ever? No, I've never. Wow. <laughs> what a finish. As all amazing finishes go, this one left us with a historic photo finish. With both drivers pushing their cars to the limit, running into each other throughout the front straightaway, Craven was able to beat Kurt Busch by just two one thousandths of a second. At that point, it was the closest finish in NASCAR Cup Series history. 
The finish would be one of the best feel-good moments in 2003, as not only would we see the biggest underdog take the victory, but it would also be the manufacturer Pontiac's last win of the Cup Series, making this finish truly a once-in-a-lifetime finish. Of course, that just leaves us with one last category that hasn't been talked about with this race, domination. It was the one thing we didn't truly see in this race, but to be honest with you, it didn't need to be. We didn't need the race to be like the first one we covered, with Ned Jarrett winning at Darlington by 14 laps over second place. We just had to grab the last 14 laps in this final race to see two drivers give us the best finish of all time. As we enter 2023, we say hello to 75 years of racing. Thousands of races have been held and over tens of thousands of drivers have made a start in NASCAR's top divisions. Truthfully, there are so many finishes that should have been covered on this list, and there will be future finishes that will deserve a spot in history. For now, we will tune in every single Sunday, watch 40 or so drivers crank their engines, take the green flag, and provide us with a true masterpiece that will unfold before our very eyes in just a few hundred miles.